This episode is brought to you by my fertility awareness programs. Master fertility awareness and improve your menstrual cycle health at the same time. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me for more information. That's fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 200. Welcome to the 200th episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I recently created a free three-part video series all about the fertility awareness method and how you can utilize the fertility awareness method to develop body literacy. So to really connect you with your cycles and really understand what's happening in your body. And so if you haven't had a chance to get your copy of my free video series, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam 101. That's fertilityfriday.com slash FAM 101 to gain access to my three-part video series all about fertility awareness charts. So again, that's fertilityfriday.com slash fam 101. Welcome to episode 200. (laughs) I don't know if I'm saying that more for me or for you, but either way, I'm really, really excited that we finally made it to episode 200. To be honest, when I started the podcast, I don't really think that I had this in mind. Like, I just never really thought that far in advance. I just thought, okay, let me start a podcast. I think I can manage a weekly release schedule. I wanted to start something that I could manage. I didn't want to kind of try to go too hard. When I was starting this podcast, there was a bunch of people who had started seven day a week podcasts or five day a week podcasts or three day a week or whatever it is. And I remember thinking, no, <laughs> no, if I'm going to continue doing this, uh, it's going to have to be something I can actually manage and something I could see myself doing. So a schedule that that felt like, okay, I could actually continue doing this for the foreseeable future. And here we are, three years in, and 200 episodes. It's just pretty surreal, actually. So really excited to be here with you today and to share this episode. So I decided to do something special. I decided to to go solo and share a topic that I realized I, you know, we've talked about it here and there. It's come up certainly in the reality series episodes that I've released, but not so much on its own. So I was actually looking at uh, the back catalog and I thought, when was the last time I did an episode about using fertility awareness for birth control? So even if you're actively trying to conceive right now and trying to avoid pregnancy and using this method for birth control is so far from your line of thinking that you know it, it really doesn't even cross your mind, one of the things that, especially uh, from you know from someone who's used fertility awareness for the past 17 years or so, <laughs> so I've used fertility awareness actively to avoid pregnancy since I was 19, and I am now 35, so it's a long time. But uh, you may not be thinking of it that way, but your reproductive life is quite long. And so even if you're actively trying to conceive at the moment, and the thought of avoiding pregnancy is far off, at some point in the future, you're either going to want to space your children or you'll want to, you know, stop having kids for a while or just, you know, stop depending on how you're going to structure your family. And so one of the things that I always talk about with my clients is that even if you're not thinking about birth control and thinking about using this method in that way, you are going to want to know how to uh, at some point, because at some point you're going to want to switch it up and either just take a couple months to space your family before you start trying again, or to when you, you know, when you're, you and when your family has reached the point where you know that, that you're comfortable, at least for a little while, then uh, most of my clients don't want to go back on hormonal birth control. So then the birth control side of it becomes really important. And often you chart a little differently when you're actively trying to conceive versus when you're avoiding. And so that can make it a little bit tougher to make the switch, especially if you never got to the point that you felt comfortable using the method uh, reliably as a form of birth control. So that's what we're going to be talking about in today's episode. And I thought that would be a great way to celebrate episode number 200 with all of you. 
And so whether you are currently actively trying to conceive or actively avoiding pregnancy, and you're wanting to delve deeper into the fertility awareness method and really gain that confidence in using the method for uh, whatever your intentions are. So using the method to achieve your intentions. If you're not feeling particularly confident in your ability to chart, or you're just wanting to feel really confident, not only in charting and understanding which days are fertile in your cycle, which days are not, but also that support to interpret what you're seeing on your chart. One of the most common things that I'm working with my clients on is really delving into the chart and seeing what you can gather, what information you can gather from your menstrual cycle chart about your overall health and fertility. And so, of course, charting is a huge part of that. We need to be able to time to understand and (laughs) based on the signs that we're seeing when you're in your fertile window, when you're not, so that you can time sex accurately if you're trying to conceive or when to avoid unprotected sex when you're actively uh, trying to avoid. But beyond that, there's so much incredible information you can gain about your overall health and fertility just by paying attention to your menstrual cycle. So for support in either or both of those areas, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me uh, to see the different programs that I offer. So I offer a number of different programs to support you in really gaining that confidence in using fertility awareness Uh, to achieve your intentions. And if you're not sure which program would be the best fit, make sure to set up a complimentary 15-minute consultation with me so we can have a little chat and figure out which program would be the best fit. And so again, that's fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. And so let's jump into today's episode. I'm so excited to chat with you about birth control. I it's 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 kind of funny if I think about it. Like it took me 200 episodes to do a solo show about birth control. That's really that's kind of funny actually. But, you know, it's really important and I love talking about using fertility awareness for birth control. I love it so much and I love it for so many different reasons. I'm sure some of you listening already know why I love it so much. I mean, one of the 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 biggest reasons that I love it and one of the biggest reasons why I started using fertility awareness as my primary method of birth control was to avoid having to use hormonal contraceptives. So to be able to not have any type of hormonal impact on my body, to just allow my, my body to just be and my cycles to just be, but to kind of harness the wisdom and uh, information that my body gives me to avoid pregnancy without having to change anything. I think that's the biggest reason why I I really love fertility awareness, especially talking about using it as a birth control method, because when you're able to gain that confidence in using fertility awareness to avoid pregnancy, then it frees you. And the analogy that I often think of is, so I've been using menstrual cups for nearly 20 years. I've been using menstrual cups for as long as I've been charting. So I started using menstrual cups right around that same age, like age 19 or so. And so uh, when I first started using menstrual cups, there was not all of these amazing options as there are now. I, my very first menstrual cup was a keeper. So you can Google that for those of you who are like, what the heck is that? And it was brown in color, not translucent. It, It was made of natural gum rubber. Uh, So I used menstrual cups pre, pre diva cup even. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because when I started using menstrual cups, it was so freeing. Like I bought one cup (laughs) and I used it for years. And so every time I walked past the, you know, feminine hygiene aisle, I was like, oh, I am, you kind of feel like, like take that pharmaceutical industry. (laughs) I don't need your products. Take that feminine hygiene industry. You don't get my money today. So That same kind of feeling that you get when you can avoid using all of those disposable products for managing your period, it's a very similar feeling that you get when you can manage your fertility without having to go to a doctor, without having to use hormones in your body, without having to really do anything outside of yourself. After you take the time to really learn and to gain that confidence and to fully just understand the method and and to know exactly how to use it, then the fear of... Uh, an unplanned pregnancy goes away (laughs) because you know how to use the method and you just have the sense of like, take that pharmaceutical industry. I don't need your medication. (laughs) And so that's one of the reasons why I, I love 
talking about fertility awareness for birth control because that's something that most women, we're just not taught. We're not taught about our bodies. We're meant to, left feeling dependent on the pharmaceutical industry because we're not really presented with any other options. And even the other non-hormonal options that are effective, such as the condom. <laughs> the condom is an effective method of birth control. Uh, when used correctly, it is 98% effective. I always thought it's interesting nowadays that the condom is kind of not really promoted as an effective form of birth control, but it is. But even the condom being highly effective in preventing pregnancy, uh, we're still basically told that, you know, if you're not on the pill, you're going to get pregnant because that's inevitable and you're fertile all the time and you have no other options. So, so yeah, this is my, my jam. I love talking about birth control, using fertility awareness for birth control. All right. So I'm going to go through with you 11 points. I'm going to go through with you 11 things that you need to know when you're using fertility awareness for birth control. So we're going to go through them one by one. I'm really excited to take you through them. So let's roll. All right. So number one is chart every day. This is extremely important when you're using fertility awareness in general, but in particular for birth control, you do need to chart your signs every single day, your fertile signs. And so the, what I'm going to be talking about is the symptothermal method, and that is a combination of your cervical mucus, your cervical position if you check your cervix, as well as your basal body temperature. And I do want to note that not every I know that not everybody listening uses the same method of charting. So there's lots of different methods of charting your cycles. Some women will use uh, basal body temperature only. Some women use uh, cervical mucus only uh, with no temperature. And some women don't check their cervical position. But I'm going to be talking about all three. Uh, so like I said, there's lots of different ways to chart. But regardless of how, like which method you use or exactly how you chart, the one thing that is in common is that you do have to chart every day. <laughs> and you do want to write down those observations. So the two parts, like number one, observation, and number two, actually write it down. And so that's really important because when you are wanting to transition to using for fertility awareness as your primary method of birth control, there's a, a significant mental shift that has to take place. So as women, we're, we're taught a lot of things about our cycle. I mean, we're taught that we're fertile every single day, but we're also taught that our cycles are always 28 days. Ovulation always happens on day 14. And it really sets up this expectation that your cycle is always going to be a certain way. And it sets up an expectation that when you start charting your cycles, all you need to do is pay attention long enough to understand your quote unquote rhythm. And then once you're, you get that, then it's kind of like you just know from then on how your cycle is going to be. So that's a myth. That's not actual reality. So I've seen <laughs> thousands of women's charts. I've worked with hundreds of women personally, you know, over the years. And what I can tell you is that no, even, even, even within the same woman's chart. So even if you looked at this, like even if you pick a woman, whoever she is, and you look at her charts over the course of a year, what you'll notice is that she does not have the same cycle just repeated over and over and over again. Uh, you'll notice that her cycles are not all of the same length. There's variation in the length of her cycles. You'll notice that she does not ovulate on the same day every single cycle. You'll notice that there's just different variations and fluctuations, per, per, perhaps in the number of days of mucus that she has or um, the quality of her period. You'll just notice some fluctuations. And so with that being said, it's really important to, to get into the mindset that I'm going to actually chart every day. Fertility awareness is not about knowing your body. I mean, I, I feel like that's, I feel like I can say that. Fertility awareness is not about knowing your body, quote unquote. It's about understanding how to identify which days are fertile and which days are not, knowing that that can shift from cycle to cycle. And so really and truly what we're doing is paying attention each day. So if today is Friday, um, <laughs> then we're going to take a look at what we're, you know, we're going to check our fertile signs on Friday. So on Friday, I'm going to check for cervical mucus throughout the day. I'm going to check my cervical position. I'm going to check my temperature first thing when I get up in the morning. And based on what I see on Friday, I'm going to then decide whether or not I'm fertile. I'm not going to base my decision of whether or not I'm fertile on when I think I'm going to ovulate this month because of when I ovulated last month or any of that stuff. I'm actually just going to pay attention to what I see today. So that's the first thing, charting every day and really getting into that mindset of whether or not I'm fertile is based on what I see today. That's, that's how this works. So number two is master your cervical mucus. And so this is key. 
Cervical mucus is the key to understanding your fertility. And the reason for that is that sperm resides in cervical mucus. It can live in cervical mucus. Without cervical mucus, sperm can't survive. So basically, whether you're fertile or not is based on whether you have cervical mucus or not that day. And so then cervical mucus takes on this really important meaning because you produce cervical mucus as you approach ovulation. So as ovulation approaches, you experience certain changes in your hormone, hormonal profile. So as you approach ovulation, you produce increasing amounts of estrogen. And as your estrogen rises, that is what triggers the production of cervical mucus. So not only is cervical mucus what keeps sperm alive, uh, if you've ever, ever heard someone say, okay, sperm can live in your body for up to five days. It's because of cervical mucus. That's what keeps it alive. It's the right pH. Uh, It has nutrients to feed them. It's a very similar pH to a man's own seminal fluid. So cervical mucus is actually critical for sperm survival. And when you're outside of your fertile window and you're not making cervical mucus, sperm can't survive. Sperm actually dies in your vagina because without cervical mucus, your vagina is too acidic for sperm to survive in. So, I mean, that's one key thing about why we need to master cervical mucus. But, you know, another thing is that you're producing cervical mucus as you approach ovulation. And so it's an an indication, a sign that your body's preparing for ovulation. So one of the things about, again, the the way that we're taught about our bodies is that we're taught that the only thing that matters is ovulation. And so a lot of women are focused on, okay, which day am I ovulating on? How do I have sex on that day? And basically with that understanding that that's the only day that matters, uh, as long as we know when ovulation day is, then we can figure out how to get pregnant or avoid it. But that's not true. So ovulation only happens on one day of the cycle and the egg doesn't live very long. (laughs) So once the egg is released from your ovary, it's gone after about 12 to 24 hours. So that's it. And the reason that our bodies make the cervical mucus is to extend that window of fertility so that it's more than just 12 hours. Like, could you imagine if there was only 12 hours every menstrual cycle that you could possibly get pregnant? It would be a lot harder to get pregnant if you were trying. And so cervical mucus allows the sperm to survive. It keeps them alive so that by the time you ovulate, the sperm is already there hanging out, well-fed, well-nourished, waiting for the egg. So that is helpful to know when you're trying to conceive, but it's also critical to know when you're avoiding pregnancy because that helps you to figure out which days of your cycle are fertile and which days are not. So it's really important to gain confidence and really understand how to uh, check for cervical mucus, how to identify the different types of cervical mucus so that you can be really, really confident about you know, which days you can get pregnant on. (laughs) So when you're avoiding pregnancy, when you see cervical mucus, so there's two main types of cervical mucus, there's peak and non-peak. And so peak, most women are familiar with that. If you've been around the fertility awareness world at all, peak mucus is clear, it's stretchy, it's slippery. It looks like raw egg whites, basically. So, and it has this really slippery quality about it so that when you're wiping yourself, you actually feel pretty slippery. And a lot of women have noticed that whether they knew about it or not, some women think that it's a, an infection <laughs> and they run to their doctor because they have discharge. And then other women will feel this kind of wet sensation and run to the bathroom thinking that their period's going to start. And it turns out that there's no period there and they get kind of confused. So when you're using fertility awareness as your primary method of birth control, it's really important to know. So we've got peak mucus and then we have non-peak. So peak is the clear, stretchy stuff. (laughs) And then non-peak is basically everything else. So non-peak is more like the lotion-y, like women will call it like lotion-y. So it's kind of like opaque, it's white in color, and it looks like hand lotion that you put between your fingers. So the important thing to know is that as you approach ovulation, regardless of whether you're seeing peak mucus or non-peak mucus, both types are considered to be fertile because as you approach ovulation, when you start making mucus, that is your, essentially that is your sign. That's your body telling you that it's preparing for ovulation. I know that, you know, there's a lot of women who will think, okay, well, you know, if it's lotion it's not as fertile, quote unquote, as the peak mucus, but it's important to know that they're both equally fertile when you are approaching ovulation. So when you're in your pre-ovulatory phase, you haven't ovulated yet, and you start to see lotion mucus, and you start to see clear, stretchy mucus. It's important to know both of those types of mucus are fertile. 
And so that's a big part of mastering your cervical mucus. And that's a huge thing that's really important to know when you're using this method for birth control, to be really, really clear on the different types of mucus and to know how to check for mucus and to know how to kind of interpret what's, what's going on there. Okay, so number three, master your basal body temperature. Although it's, there are methods of fertility awareness that don't require basal body temperature charting. And ultimately, you can use fertility awareness successfully with, without temperature. If you're very, very com- comfortable and confident in charting your cervical mucus, it is possible to chart without basal body temperature. However, <laughs> uh, you know, as someone who teaches women how to chart and someone who's charted myself for all these years, I can tell you that basal body temperature is extremely helpful in pinpointing ovulation. It's a great way to, to really kind of differentiate between your pre-ovulatory phase and post-ovulatory phase. It's like you put it on a graph. It can be pretty straightforward. And especially for women who are just first starting to learn and still trying to kind of figure out and understand and gain confidence in you using their cervical mucus and kind of interpreting all of the different changes within cervical mucus in the fertile window, the, the basal body temperature is a great way. It's a great secondary sign to add to mucus so that you can feel even more confident. If you're anything like me, like more information is often good. And most of my clients really appreciate having additional information, having something to kind of triangulate. So when you have two signs, the mucus and the basal body temperature, and you're able to use them together, then it gives you more information. And that helps you to get feel even more confident. For those of you who aren't that familiar with basal body temperature, it's a measure of your resting metabolism. And what's really interesting is that after you ovulate, as your progesterone levels rise, that raises your body temperature. So when you're charting your cycles and you're taking your temperature each morning, you can actually see the change in your temperature after ovulation. And for women who are charting their cycles then and actively using fertility awareness as their primary form of birth control, this is fantastic news. <laughs> so once you understand what's happening in your cycle, and okay, so at the beginning of your cycle, you have your period, and then you typically have a few days before you start seeing cervical mucus. As you go into your fertile window, you'll start to see cervical mucus, and that'll lead up to ovulation. So of course, I'm talking about like a kind of a, the cycle in general, like a healthy cycle. And so after ovulation, then your mucus should dry up, and then you would have your luteal phase. So then you'd have about two weeks so about 12 to 14 days after ovulation without cervical mucus. And after ovulation happens, your cervical mucus dries up. So you'll remember that I said that sperm can't live (laughs) in your body unless you have cervical mucus. So your mucus dries up. We'll talk a little bit more about the cervical position, but your cervix closes. So like it's, it's actually closed. You can feel the difference. You can feel the shift. And ovulation only happens once in the cycle. So once ovulation happens, that's it. There are a series of hormonal changes that occur after ovulation that prevent further ovulation. And you can actually feel that change and and witness it for yourself. So you don't have to take my word for it. You can actually pay attention and feel the change in your cervix. Like, so you can feel that it's closed now. (laughs) You can see that you no longer have cervical mucus and you can see your temperature going up, meaning that you're not, there's no more ovulation in that cycle. So it's great news when you're charting specifically for the purpose of birth control, because once you've confirmed ovulation with the temperatures, then you know that you can no longer get pregnant for the rest of your cycle. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, there's there's a good number of women who use fertility awareness as temperature only, because once you understand how the temperature works and you really get comf- comfortable and confident using temperature to confirm ovulation, then it's a very, it's a highly effective <laughs> method of birth control because once that temperature, you know, goes up and stays up and you, you understand, you, you know, the other signs match up, you know that you've ovulated already and you can't ovulate again for the rest of your cycle. Sperm can't live in your body. And so you can't get pregnant for the rest of your cycle. So mastering your basal body temperature is key to using fertility awareness for birth control. Uh, makes it It's just, to be honest, I would have a hard time um, using fertility awareness without the option of basal body temperature, just because I really like it. I really like having that additional piece of data. All right. So that brings me to number four. So number four is always do a cross check. 
So this is basically bringing together the signs that we're talking about already. So we talked about cervical mucus and basal body temperature. And so what a cross check is, is looking at those two signs and waiting for them to match up. And, and that's to confirm ovulation. Interestingly enough, this doesn't only apply to birth control. It's also really important when you're trying to conceive that you match up those signs to verify ovulation. I've seen a lot of women make assumptions, you know, oh, I think I ovulated, but they don't wait for those signs to match up. And so maybe they stop having sex, like they stop trying and they miss out on some of the best days before ovulation actually took place. So doing a cross check, all that means is getting, it, it kind of gets into the rules. So for those of you who've tried it for a while, you might know that there are some specific rules about fertility awareness charting in order to put a buffer around your fertile window so that you can't get pregnant. So you're fertile on the days that you have mucus. And then when your mucus dries up, you have to add three days as a buffer so that you can just ensure that your you did in fact ovulate, your mucus did in fact dry up, your cervix did in fact close, and you know when you're charting temperature that your temperature in fact went up. When you're taking your temperatures, what you'll notice is when you plot them in your app or on paper, you'll see that your pre-ovulatory temperatures fall within a certain range. And then after ovulation, you'll see a rise. So the temperature rises and then it, it, it then stays up for the rest of the cycle if you did ovulate. And so in order to confirm ovulation, then you'd have to wait until you're, you, you know, you have three temperatures that are above, that are higher than the previous six. So if you look at a graph, you would see a very clear like rise and you would be able to take a ruler and draw a line between the two. So you'd see that the pre-ovulatory temperatures are lower than the post-ovulatory temperatures. So all this means is that when you're using fertility awareness for birth control, and you're using the symptothermal method, so you're charting both mucus and basal body temperature, you're going to wait until you both of those signs line up before you can say, okay, I confirmed ovulation and I'm actually going to have sex in my uh, luteal phase, in my post-ovulatory phase. So you wait until both of those signs match up. All right, number five, know the difference between a fertile day and an infertile day. So, I mean, that seems pretty obvious. Like, obviously, you can't use this method <laughs> for birth control if you don't know the difference between a fertile day and an infertile day. But that's exactly my point. It's really important to be clear on that, to know exactly how to differentiate. I think a lot of women are clear on the post-ovulatory uh, infertile period because, you know, as you'll remember from the previous point, when you see that both of those signs have lined up, so your mucus dried up and your temperature rose and it stayed high, like the, the, that confirms ovulation. And so for the rest of the cycle, you know, okay, I confirmed it. I know I ovulated. And so I know these days are, are not fertile. But the challenge comes in the, in the pre-ovulatory phase because before ovulation, in order to identify which days are fertile and infertile, you have to be really clear on what you're seeing in terms of your cervical mucus observations. So that's what I mean when I say know the difference between a fertile day and an infertile day. So I touched on this already when I talked about the two different types of mucus. So knowing that both peak mucus and non-peak mucus are fertile, that's really important so that you're not really so that you're not guessing, so that you don't think, oh, well, I just have a little bit of mucus today. <laughs> it's totally fine for me to have sex. Knowing that when you see mucus, that makes it a fertile day. So if you're in your pre-ovulatory phase and you see cervical mucus, it's a fertile day. <laughs> so, so there's that. But a big part of being clear on that is knowing the difference between like a dry day and a mucus day. And so like I mentioned, there's all kinds of different ways to chart. There's different, there's different ways to check for cervical mucus. There's different charting modalities. There's lots of different organizations that teach charting. And at the end of the day, in order to use fertility awareness effectively for birth control, you're going to need to be able to tell the difference between a fertile day and an infertile day. Now, number six is find your cervix. So I'll put a caveat on this that it is possible to chart without checking your cervix. Cervix is an optional sign. Every woman does not check her cervix and doesn't necessarily need to check her cervix in order to feel comfortable with the method. But there are situations where I do encourage my clients to check their cervix. And so one of those situations is when there are limited and or no 
very little cervical mucus observations. So, you know, unfortunately, just given the the reality of the rea- the realities of hormonal birth control, for women who have been on hormonal birth control for a really long time, it is more it is common. Uh, it's not something that you see every single time, but it is common for women who've used hormonal birth control for a really long time. So, you know, you know, several years, maybe ten years or more, to have less mucus when they first come off of of birth control. And so there's a reason for that. Hormonal birth control changes the structure of your cervix and it increases the the, the crypts that produce your cervical mucus plug. So basically you end up with fewer of the cervical crypts that make the peak clear, stretchy mucus. And so, you know, not everyone's the same. Some women come off of hormonal birth control and their mucus is flowing fine. There's no problems. And then other women come off of hormonal birth control and they have very few days of mucus. And some of, some of my clients have, you know, rarely have any days of actual peak mucus. So they'll, you know, they'll see a a bit of a change and they might see some non-peak mucus as they approach ovulation. But some of my clients with a history of long-term birth control use won't have any. And so in those situations, the cervix becomes really helpful and important to help you identify when you're in your fertile window. Because uh, again, if you can't use one of the primary pieces of information that you need to use in order to use fertility awareness, then you have to rely on, you know, as the other other options in terms of Im- information gathering. And so that basically involves checking your cervix. So checking your cervix every day for a full cycle, at least so that you have an understanding of what your cervix does, how it feels, what it feels like when you're in your fertile window and what it feels like after ovulation. And that really helps because once you can start to identify the changes, how your cervix changes when you're in your fertile window and how your cervix changes after ovulation, it gives you another another piece of data that can help you to identify your fertile window and help you to feel more confident about using this method for birth control. So one of the things that I always say to my clients is that all of the changes that you're seeing throughout your menstrual cycle are happening as a direct result of the hormonal changes. <laughs> so as your estrogen rises, that is what triggers all of these changes. So estrogen is what triggers changes in your cervix. It's what triggers changes in your cervical mucus. And it's ultimately what triggers ovulation. And so then after ovulation, it's progesterone that triggers you know, the changes in your cervix again, the changes in your cervical mucus production. So what you're seeing is a result of these hormones. And since it's all connected, when you pay attention to these signs, they line up. So your cervical mucus production is going to line up with your cervical position and the the texture of your cervix, where your cervix is in your vagina. And it's going to line up with your temperatures, the temperature changes. I mean, sometimes it doesn't line up like exactly with the day. And so you'd have to kind of look further into your chart to identify some of those uh, anomalies. But ultimately, it's really helpful to keep in mind that these are all changes that are happening simultaneously because of the hormones. Finding your cervix is is very helpful when you're using the method, especially if you, what I always say as well is that it's helpful to to know how your cervix changes in your cycle, because if you ever have a cycle where your mucus is off or you couldn't check your temperature because of your, you were sick or something like that, it's really, really helpful to have your cervix as a, a third sign to kind of triangulate everything else. So in Uh, For those of you who aren't that familiar with the changes in your cervix, as you approach ovulation, your cervix will change. It typically will get softer. It'll change position in your vagina. You might find that it's a little bit higher than normal. And then after ovulation, you'll find that uh, your cervix, it firms up. So it feels a little bit firmer. And you might find that it's a bit lower. Like if you try to find it, you might find that it's higher around ovulation and lower after ovulation. So every woman's cervix is not exactly the same. And there are certainly nuances to look for, but the most significant and obvious change that occurs is the change that happens after you ovulate. So the cervix can be a really, really helpful third sign to confirm ovulation. So especially if you have some temperatures that are kind of wonky or some cervical mucus that doesn't really make that much sense, if you pay attention to your cervix as a third sign, then the cervix is really clear (laughs) of when ovulation happens, as long as you've given yourself an opportunity to get familiar with it. So, So yes, get to know your cervix, find it, love it check it, chart it, and it'll help you to make sense of the other two signs, especially in a pinch. All right, number seven. This is, this is really important. Know what to do when in doubt. 
So, I mean, life is life. Life happens. As much as we have the best intentions, it's not every single day of our lives that goes exactly as planned. And so there's going to be, I mean, if, if you're anything like me and you're charting over several years of your life, I mean, if you find fertility awareness towards the, the beginning or the middle of your your reproductive life, so like mid-20s, 30s, like you still have decades potentially, like decade singular or maybe even decades plural to chart your cycles. So what that means is that you're going to have some days where you, you know, you don't get a chance to chart or you don't, you forget to take your temperature or you forget to write down what you saw. It's, it's just life. And so what's really important is kind of, it goes back to number one. When I So number one was chart every day. And also to really get that sense of fertility awareness is about on every day, am I fertile or not that day based on what I saw. So if you didn't check, <laughs> if you didn't look at your signs that day, if you didn't check for me because that day, if you didn't take your temperature that day, if you didn't check your cervix that day, then you don't know what's going on. <laughs> and you can't assume that you know based on what you had a previous cycle. So if you don't check, you don't know what's happening. And therefore, you have to assume that you're fertile. So all it means when I say, do you know what to do in doubt? When you're in doubt, and so doubt means you're not really understanding what you're seeing on your chart, or you didn't really check. (laughs) And so you don't actually know if you had mucus or not that day, like you legitimately don't know because you didn't look, then that means you have to consider yourself fertile, plus a buffer period. So that's really important. And so that brings me to number eight. So number eight, which is the buffer period. You can call it the count of three, you can call it the rule of three, or you can call it a buffer period. But either way, I mentioned it a little bit, which is that, you know, fertility awareness, just in the general sense, understanding that you produce mucus around ovulation and that there's several, you know, basically there's only six days of your cycle when you can get pregnant. That general understanding is different than kind of following specific rules to avoid pregnancy. So when it comes to the specific rules for trying to avoid pregnancy, those rules basically add a buffer period to ensure that you're going to not get pregnant if that's what you're going for. So what that means is that when you see cervical mucus and your mucus dries up, you don't automatically assume that the day after, so let's say today is Friday, (laughs) and let's say that you have cervical mucus on Friday, And then Saturday, you don't have any mucus. And Sunday, you don't have any mucus. So basically, you ovulated and your mucus is done. So you can't just have sex on the Saturday. You need to give yourself a bit of a buffer. So that would be the count of three or the rule of three. And so um, basically, what that buffer period does is it gives you basically three days grace so that you can take a moment to confirm whether or not you actually did ovulate. My clients will often hear me say, especially if the chart is a little bit, like this, just not clear, we're not really sure if ovulation happened, we're not really sure based on what we're seeing because it's not clear, you'll often hear me say, well, you know, wait three days and see what happens. Wait three days and see what happens. And the reason that I say that is because let's say that you are charting your cycles and you had several days of cervical mucus, And then you notice that your mucus dried up. So again, like you had mucus up until Friday, and then Saturday you don't have any mucus. But when you took your temperature, your temperature didn't rise. And so like it looks like you ovulated because the mucus isn't there, but the temperature didn't change. And so then you take your temperature the following day, and it still didn't change. So, you know, in those situations, I've had many clients will say, well, I must have ovulated. But until you see the data... And until the data lines up, you can't make those kinds of assumptions because I've seen the other side where the mucus went away, maybe because something stressful happened. So meaning that you didn't ovulate and that's why the temperatures didn't rise. And so then a couple days later, mucus comes back and then all of a sudden you ovulate. So if you're trying to avoid pregnancy, it's really, really important not to go on your feelings. (laughs) So kind of like, I don't want to say ignore your feelings, but I'm kind of saying it like ignore your feelings because you want to go on the data. So you want to make sure that you give yourself that three-day buffer period, especially if you're in doubt, uh, if you're not sure what you're seeing, and also just the standard. You give yourself three days after the mucus dries up to verify that it was in fact ovulation. When your temperature rises, you wait until you see three high temperatures so that you can confirm that that 
that ovulation actually happened. And then you look at both of those signs and, and put them together to make sure they match up. So three days of dried up mucus plus three days of high temperatures. And then together, that gives you more information. It gives you more data. It allows you to do the cross check. And so then you can feel more confident about what you're doing. <laughs> and so this is the difference between actively using fertility awareness as a birth control method and then kind of versus having this idea that like, you know, what's going to happen in your cycle. So when you're actually using the method and following the rules correctly, you have a good understanding. If you don't take chances, if you actually follow what the rules are, then that's what leads to the level of effectiveness that the studies tell us is up to 99.4%. And so that is the importance of the buffer period. So number nine is another really important point. Uh, know where you are on the intention scale. And so uh, the intention scale, I mean, there's different, I'm sure there's different people, different interpretations of this, but throughout the years, what I found, especially between women who use this method, is that we're all somewhere on the scale between zero and 10, let's say. So zero is like, I don't want to have kids right now ever at all. Zero kids. I'm, I'm like not... I'm not available to have children. And so I'm 100% committed to like not getting pregnant. And then 10 is like, I want a baby so bad. I've been trying for so long and I still haven't had a baby. So just to kind of give you that sense of like zero to 10. And we're all on that scale somewhere, but not all of us are super polarized. Everybody is in a zero and everybody is in a 10. And so part of using fertility awareness and relying on it for birth control, part of it is having a conversation with yourself to really get a sense of where you are actually at. So, you know, there's a lot of women who, although they may not be actively trying and they don't really want to have a baby right now, they might be willing to take certain risks because it's not totally out of the question for them to have a child right now. And so ultimately the method is the same, but the person is different. So a person who is at, like, who's not trying to conceive and is very much at a zero, like no children right now, they may be adverse to certain risks that another woman might take. And a part of, it's not about judgment. It's not about anything. It's just about getting really clear on what your intentions are and adding that to your understanding of the method to use it correctly. And that certainly plays into another really important part of using fertility awareness for birth control, which is managing your fertile window. So knowing where you are in terms of where you are on the intention scale, it, it really governs how you're going to manage your fertile window. So some of my clients will not have any sex during their fertile window. So they'll use fertility awareness in, in earnest in the way that it's intended. So the studies that have been done on fertility awareness, in those studies, then the couple doesn't have sex on their fertile days. So this, is, this isn't to say what you should or shouldn't do ultimately, but it's important to know that if you are using the fertility awareness method and you identify that, you know, you identify your fertile window. If you have sex on those days that you've identified as fertile and you use a condom or you use a diaphragm or you use withdrawal or some other type of birth control, it's really important to know that when you have sex on your fertile days, you're not using fertility awareness. Like if you are, if you're having sex and you use a condom, like you're using a condom. <laughs> and so your effectiveness is going to be based on the condom. Or if you use a cervical cap, or if you use a, a diaphragm, or if you use withdrawal or something like that, like you're not actually using fertility awareness on those days. On those days, you're using the barrier method that you chose. And so then the effectiveness is based on the barrier. And so where you are on that intention scale is going to govern how you manage that window. So some women won't have, like, they'll, they'll abstain, like, they won't have sex. Other women may choose to have uh, alternate sex. So no, you know, penetration, penile vaginal penetration, but they'll have, you know, other, other activities that don't involve penis and vagina. And other women will use withdrawal or they'll use condoms or they'll use, you know, all the different types of uh, birth control. And so having that conversation with yourself of where am I on the intention scale? How comfortable am I with pregnancy right now? Like if I'm at a zero, I have to take that into consideration when I'm just figuring out how I'm going to manage my fertile window versus if you're a little bit more, if you're kind of like not decided and you're wanting to, to let 
that decision be made for you. So I think in, in terms of effectively using fertility awareness for birth control, it just involves a grown-up conversation with yourself and with your partner about how you're going to manage your fertile window and what would happen if you were using a condom and the condom slipped off, what would you do in that situation? And so ultimately, you know, that's part of it too. And I'll, and interesting w when we think about having this conversation with fertility awareness, but it's the same conversation you have to have with any other type of birth control. So even hormonal birth control or condoms or, you know, there's failure rates with all birth control methods. So regardless, it's important to have these conversations. But I think when you're using fertility awareness, it just becomes more apparent that you should be um, really thinking about these things and figuring out, okay, how am I going to manage my fertile window and have that conversation with your partner about what you're going to do, uh, what you would do to manage anything that, that did happen. All right. So number 10, getting your partner on board. <laughs> and so I've, I've had a lot of questions about this come up in my Facebook group. And of course, this is a topic that comes up in my client work. And uh, I just want to share with you an interesting observation that I've made over the years. So the majority of the women that I work with are, you know, partnered with male partners. And what I find is that overwhelmingly, their partners are are actually very supportive. And so for those of you who are who have been using fertility awareness, or for those of you who this is, you know, new to you, and maybe this is something that you're just starting to communicate with your partner about. My experience has been so far that overwhelmingly, um, the majority of the the women who I've worked with, their partners are actually really, really supportive. And there's a number of different reasons for that. I think one of the reasons is when concerns of of health come up. So if, if a woman had a really negative, for instance, if you had a really negative experience on hormonal birth control and it, you know, changed you emotionally and you reacted badly to it, then, you know, a lot of partners are, they just don't want their, you know, they just don't want you to suffer. They don't want to you to take anything that's, that's actually having a negative impact on your health. And, and just beyond that, just to kind of support, just to support what you're doing. But for those of you who are, concerned about how to get your partner on board. I do have just a couple of suggestions <laughs> for how to make that a bit easier. And the first one might come as a surprise, but the first step to getting your partner on board is actually to make sure that you're educated about it. And so when you're not yet confident about what you're talking about, <laughs> when you're not yet confident in the method and you don't fully understand how it works and you can't really communicate that clearly to your partner, that that makes it a little bit more challenging because then it's not necessarily that your partner doesn't trust the method or believe you, but if you're not coming across as confident when you describe it because you yourself don't fully understand it yet and you're not fully there with your own confidence, then that that's a that's a big deal. So I would say the very first step to get your partner on board is to fully educate yourself. So ultimately, I have yet to have a male approach me to learn fertility awareness and to join one of my programs, although the programs are for women, but I'm just, it's tongue in cheek there. But ultimately, if you are in a relationship and you're wanting your partner to come on board with fertility awareness, then you are the first point of contact. You're the one that has to educate your partner about it. And before you can educate somebody else about something, you have to actually educate yourself. And the only way that it's going to come across as, you know, valid and and to to have someone else be confident in it is if, if you're confident in it to begin with. So I would say the first step is to take the time that you need to fully understand the method, to fully learn the method. And especially if you are planning to rely on fertility awareness as your primary method of birth control, uh, especially if you've recently come off the pill or if your cycles aren't particularly straightforward, or even if your cycles are straightforward, <laughs> I would say that given just my experience personally using the method, I would say that you will benefit from seeking support just to make sure. So seeking support from a charting instructor in a particular method of fertility awareness so that you can be very, very confident in your ability to chart. And then once you are confident and once you fully understand to the point that you can actually explain it very clearly to your partner and share the learning materials that you have and just really get your partner on board because 
they can feel your confidence. They know that you know what you're talking about. (laughs) It helps your partner to then feel more confident if you are confident. And so I, I, this is a conversation that I've had with a number of clients when just when their partners have questions, it's not necessarily that the partner isn't supportive, but just there's questions about it. It's like, you know, how does this work or how does that work? And it can come across as though they don't believe you or they don't trust you. But at the same time, if you're not, you know, if you're not communicating confidently <laughs> about the method, then it can come across on the other side that you don't really know what you're talking about. And that can make it harder for someone to really get on board and trust it. And so I've had conversations with that where I kind of role play with my client about like, okay, so if I was talking to my partner, this is how I would talk about this thing. And this is how I would talk about that thing in these words. And then, you know, why don't you say it back to me? Like, how would you describe this part of it to your partner so that he knows or what's going on um, on this day and, and why you're doing this and why, and to make it really black and white. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is, and and this depends a lot on your partner. You know, everyone's relationship is different. So with some of the women I work with, their partners are really involved and really want to know what's going on and will even just be part of it, be part of the charting. So whether that's like, you know, giving, passing the thermometer to you in the morning or, or monitoring your charts, like to absolutely not having anything to do with it and it just being totally up to you to to share which days are fertile, which days are not. But wherever it is in your relationship, one of the things that you can do, if appropriate, if it fits the situation, if it fits the relationship with you and your partner, is to share your charts. For instance, like paper charts are helpful for this. I know not everyone charts with paper, but if your partner is kind of like a data nerd and really wants to know, because sometimes your partner really wants to know, having the chart and having it up. So a number of my clients have done that where they actually have the paper chart, they have it up somewhere or, you know, on the desk or whatever. And so their partner can see them recording their their fertile signs, their mucus, their temperature every day. And so then it's very clear and obvious and very upfront exactly what's happening to the point where your partner will be able to kind of identify where you are in the cycle. So I I completely recognize (laughs) that it's not like that for everybody. And I, uh, I'm not saying that it needs to be like that, but I'm saying that for some couples, it's actually really helpful just to have it all out there in the open so that your partner can clearly see what's going on and be involved and kind of have that bit of understanding because that that's how you get your partner on board. Like, so that they kind of understand what is going on and they can see it and it's, and they know, they know what's going on. And then, I mean, there's other ways, depending on where you live, uh, depending on what services are available close to you, it might be possible to even, you know, take a class and bring your partner or have sessions with somebody. And if your partner really wants to participate, like to have your partner attend a class with you. So there are certain organizations that actually specifically teach couples so that both partners can be on board, because ultimately with this method, you need the cooperation of, of both people. And so although it's it's not something that happens all the time, I have uh, had uh, private sessions w- with my clients where their partners have attended the session as well. Not necessarily every session, but, you know, one or two so that they can really get a sense of what's happening. And then uh, it just builds confidence. And with that, you know, when you do take a class, when you do take the time to really learn a specific method and gain that confidence, you know, that's another thing. That's another way because then they can see like, oh, wait, this is actually a real thing. <laughs> You know, uh, one of my clients mentioned to me, you know, that like, wow, there's a lot of, you have a lot of sessions with this woman. <laughs> You're going in a lot of depth. Like this is real, this is really something, something serious, something legitimate. And so there's lots of different ways to get your partner on board. But I think that just to get your, you know, just to get some thoughts out there of, of how to do it and what are some of the different, like different ways it could look and some of the different things that you could do. But uh, ultimately, as long as you're confident and you're able to clearly and confidently explain what's happening, that makes a really big difference. And so that brings me to the last point. So the number 11, what I wanted to share about using fertility awareness for birth control. And so to, <laughs> to kind of conclude the list, number 11 is know that your friends, family, and healthcare practitioners may not support your decision to use FAM. So it's, it's you know, maybe it's not a good idea to end on a downer, but just to put it out there, 
uh, this is an experience that's really common to a lot of the women who I've worked with. And over the years, a lot of the women who I know, just being a fertility awareness educator, having done this for so long, I know a lot of women who chart (laughs) their cycles. And so I've heard a lot of different experiences. And when you make this decision initially, so when you first decide to do this, you you might be so excited that you're kind of sharing with your friends and your family and your doctors. And I think many women will, you know, make an appointment with their doctor, of course, you know, because they're going off the, the hormonal birth control, only to find their doctor telling them like, well, no, you need to be on the pill. If you're not on the pill, then you're going to get pregnant. And really basically telling them this method doesn't work. It's it's not effective and you're just going to end up pregnant. So I don't know why you're doing this. So that can be really disheartening. And so I think if you if you just know that fertility awareness is still, it's not mainstream, although it's made so many strides <laughs> since when I first discovered it, there was nothing compared to what there is now. There's so much more information available. There's so many more resources. Uh, so many more women are doing it. And it's it's even, you know, getting trendy. Fertility awareness has its own tech now. There's like a whole industry of different thermometers and devices that are you know, targeting women who chart. And when I was first learning, that did not exist (laughs) at all. That was not a thing. So even with all of those strides, even though fertility awareness has gained just a ton of ground, it's still fringe and it's still not something that most people know about. And it's still not something that most people are educated about. So even though there's scientific literature, research showing the effectiveness, even though there are, you know, millions of women around the world who who practice fertility awareness and use it successfully to avoid pregnancy and use it as a legitimate form of birth control, that doesn't mean that your friends or your family or your health practitioner is going to know about it and is going to support your decision to use it. And so uh, one of the things that there's a couple of different ways to think about it, but ultimately, if you're using fertility awareness and you've really taken the time to educate yourself and to gather resources, to take a class, to really, you know, jump in and, and do this, then <laughs> know that you probably know more about it than your friends and your family and your healthcare practitioners. You know, most doctors, most healthcare practitioners are not well educated about fertility awareness and often still believe the kind of dogmatic myths and all of those things out there about the women's menstrual cycle. After all, before each of us discovered fertility awareness, we believed it too. (laughs) So until I discovered fertility awareness, I believed that I was fertile every single day. And I believed that the, the pill was really the only way to, you know, prevent pregnancy effectively. So I also, <laughs> so in each of us, uh, I'm sure every every single woman who's listening right now, before you discovered fertility awareness, you were that person as well. Ultimately, I think we have to approach the situation with some compassion and understanding and and a little just bit of reality. So know that, you know, no one has to agree with your choice to to use fertility awareness and and no one really needs to understand it either. I think the key that's it kind of comes back to that point about getting yourself educated and really gaining that confidence because when you're confident, when you've taken the time to educate yourself, when you've taken the time to to get some resources, connect with a teacher, uh, take a class, really just whatever you need to do to feel confident, then when someone tells you, oh, it doesn't work, you know it doesn't work. It's the same way like if someone were to tell you that you were purple. You're like, I'm not purple. <laughs> this is silly. When you're really confident and when you've really done your homework and you're really educated about it, then if if your doctor tells you like, oh, that doesn't work, you're, you need to be on the pill, then you're in a place where you can say, no, I'm good, thanks. I've been using it. I it, it's it's working for me, and I'm really confident in it. If I were to go to a, a doctor and the doctor told me would t- tell me that it didn't work, I would just say uh, I don't even know what I would say, but I probably would just nod my head and go about my day because I know that it works because I've been using it for almost two decades. So that's the last point of it. So just to go through. Um, what you need to know uh, when you're using fertility awareness for birth control, kind of going through one by one. Number one is to chart every day. Number two is to master your cervical mucus. Number three, master your BBT, your basal body temperature. Number four, always do a cross check. Number five is know the difference between a fertile day and an infertile day. Number six is find your cervix. Number seven is know what to do when in doubt. Number eight is understand the buffer period. So know uh, the count of three. 
Number nine is know where you stand on the intention scale. Number 10 is get your partner on board, (laughs) how to do that. And number 11 is know that your friends, family, and practitioners may not support your decision to use fertility awareness as your primary method of birth control. And so I hope that you enjoyed this episode. I was really excited to share just some thoughts on using fertility awareness for birth control. I do think it involves a bit of a mindset shift for everyone involved. And, you know, the first mindset shift is like, whoa, I'm not fertile every single day. There's only a small window of fertility and I can learn how to figure out what that is. The second part is to kind of like leave behind the thoughts of, basically the thoughts of the rhythm methods <laughs> that we've been trained to believe throughout our whole lives. So leaving behind the idea that, you know, all I need to do is watch my cycle a bit and then I'm going to learn the the pattern and I don't have to chart anymore. So really getting a sense of like, I'm, I'm going to watch my fertile, like my fertile signs each day. I'm going to get really comfortable with my cervical mucus observations, my basal body temperature, my cervical position. And then at the end of each day, I'm going to know if I'm fertile or not based on what I saw. So kind of getting into that like real time day-to-day mentality about charting. And then there's always an interesting part of the journey when you, okay, so you've done your homework, you've gotten some resources, you know, you have taking charge of your fertility, you know, you're taking a class, you're, you're working with an instructor. There's a difference between understanding something in a book theoretically. So knowing theoretically that there are certain days of your cycle when you can have unprotected sex with your partner and not get pregnant. But there's like this, this, when it, it, it it's kind of like when it becomes real. <laughs> so it's different knowing, okay, this is how it is. I understand from a scientific standpoint, blah, 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 to actually going and having the sex on um, once you've identified your fertile window and, and you really understand everything. So there's all of these stages that you go through. It's normal to feel to nervous and scared. And so as a guideline, when you're working with an instructor, you're going to want to take that very first cycle <laughs> and not use your cycle, like not use fertility awareness in that first cycle. So you're going to want to take that one full cycle when you're working with an instructor and use protection (laughs) or don't have sex, but however you're going to manage that. You want to really take the time to go through a full cycle to gain that confidence in identifying your fertile window, identifying ovulation, being really, really confident in how to use all those signs before you start using the method. Now, when you're not working with an instructor, if you're teaching yourself using a book or using other types of resources, then you're going to want to take three full cycles to really learn and understand what's happening. And so if that sounds like a a little bit much, there's all of these different things that can happen (laughs) when you start charting your cycles. First of all, getting used to the fact that your cycle isn't going to be the same every single, every single time. Ovulation can, can fluctuate, can change, it can be delayed, it can come a little bit early, depending on what's happening. And so it's very real that your cycle can fluctuate. So it's important to wait three cycles so that you get a sense of what your body's actually doing, what your cycles really look like. And there's a lot that can happen in three cycles. So it's a really important part of your education (laughs) to really take that time before you start using the method uh, for birth control. So those are the suggestions, of course, best practices in order to get the most out of the method. But you certainly can kind of curtail that learning curve when you work with somebody who can guide you through that process and kind of share with you all of the different things that can happen. So it cuts down that self-learning time (laughs) from three months to one month. And ultimately, what I always tell my clients is that there's no magical number. Some of my clients are really comfortable after that first cycle. So kind of going into cycle number two, as we're working together, starting with the post-ovulatory phase. And other clients will actually take a couple more cycles to feel confident and comfortable because they're feeling a little bit more conservative and they know where they are on the intention scale. So again, this is a personal decision that, that everyone has to make for themselves. And not everyone's cycles are the same. So some of my clients, their cycles are super straightforward. Other clients, they have a lot of different challenges and, and different signs that they're looking at. Perhaps they're having mucus, you know, all the time or not at all. And that the, both of those scenarios are, make charting more complex. Perhaps they have delayed ovulation or double peak, meaning that their body moves towards ovulation. So they start to see mucus, but then something happens and their body kind of backs off 
And then, you know, a couple days later, the mucus comes back. So whatever the case is, there's different situations that if you're not prepared for them, if you're not ready for them, if you're not following the rules (laughs) and not waiting for things to match up, then you can end up having sex on a day that is actually fertile, uh, but you didn't realize that it was fertile. With that said, I hope that you enjoyed this episode and we will be chatting about this in the Fertility Friday Facebook group. So if you're not yet part of the group, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash community to get your invitation to join us. And we're going to be talking about using fertility awareness as birth control and what your thoughts are on my list. Is there something that you would add to the list? Is there something that, you know, maybe you didn't think should be on the list? What else would you add to this list of what we need to know if we're using this method for birth control. So I just want to thank you for listening to this episode. You'll find the show notes page for episode 200 over at fertilityfriday.com slash 200. And if you're ready to transition into using the fertility awareness method as your primary method of birth control, but you're a little scared because I mean, after years of being taught that we can get pregnant on every day of our cycles and, and perhaps years of using hormonal birth control, thinking that that was the only way to avoid pregnancy effectively, it's understandable. It's really normal to be afraid. It's a huge step. It's a huge step emotionally and physically to come off this medication and to actually, you know, not be on it and not want to get pregnant. And, and to believe that it's possible to do that. And so, you know, I could tell you both from professional and personal experience that it is possible. And to, in order for the method to be effective, I mean, in order to kind of set yourself up for the highest effectiveness rate, the best thing to do is to invest in a class, to take a class, to have somebody walk you through. And all of the effectiveness studies that have been done have been done with women who have been trained by instructors, so certified instructors. And so if you're at the stage where you're wanting to, you know, not have to rely on hormones for birth control, and you're wanting to be really confident in using this method effectively, then I would encourage you to seek support. And so I offer a number of programs to help you to gain that confidence in using the method to be really, really clear on which days of your cycle are fertile, which days are not, so that you just know kind of inside and out how it works, how to do it, so that it feels easy by the end. <laughs> and that's that's the whole point. For more information, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. And if you're not sure which program would be the best fit, you can always set up a complimentary 15-minute consultation with me and we can go through the different options and, and see which one would be the best fit for you. So again, that's fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. And of course, I want to thank you for tuning in to today's episode. We made it. Episode number 200. It is just incredible. It's exciting. I saw it coming up and I was thinking like, wow, like this is <laughs> this is crazy at uh, 200 episodes. And uh, really, it's, it's interesting to see what can happen when you just kind of take one foot in front of the other. I don't think I, you know, intended to, to, to I didn't intend necessarily, but just by continuing to put out an episode every week for the last three years, here we are. So I'm really pleased and very proud of this milestone. I think it's really exciting. And so make sure to come and celebrate with us in the Fertility Friday Facebook group. And so thanks so much for listening. And as always, be well and happy charting.